Good evening, everyone. My name is Matthew Hayes. I'm uh, one of the organizers of Tertullius Fredrickson. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, that we are on uh, stolen uh, Willistiqua territory. Many of the organizers, in any case, are on uh, stolen Willistiqua territory. And I'm going to read out the land acknowledgement that Grand Chief Ron Tremblay um, uh, has uh, given to us and that's published in the MB Media Co-op. Um, uh, Grand Chief uh, Ron Tremblay writes, I respectfully acknowledge in our homeland of Willistiquuk that we, the Willistiqua, have never surrendered one speck of earth, one drop of water, or one breath of air. Since first contact, representatives of the British Crown have strived to eliminate Willistiqua by violently stealing our lands and resources and by forcing our people onto reservations in the act of genocide. The Provincial Conservative Party strives to continue systemic racism, dictatorship, and colonialism from which they have built their solid foundation. The Provincial Conservative Party continues to ignore the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And the Provincial Conservative Party continues the act of genocide. Um, we here at Tertullius Fredrickson uh, always begin by mentioning that uh, the land on which we are organizing this event is stolen land. And this uh, language is important. It's a way of also um, recognizing that many of our lives are shaped by this act of uh, dispossession. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes we will revere people, for instance, who have been um, uh, generous uh, uh, in terms of their philanthropy. Uh, and we remember um, by recognizing this dispossession that much of that philanthropy is made possible by acts of theft. Um, so we're uh, Tertullius Fredericton, um, organized by Christy Lane, uh, Tracy Glynn, Daniel Tubb, and myself, Matthew Hayes. Um, we're sponsored by the NB Media Co-op and by Milda's Pizza. If you um, had an opportunity to get a pizza tonight, uh, your belly is full, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, tonight's speaker is uh, Catherine, uh, uh, Katie Thorstenstein. Um, she focuses on uh, contemporary theories of sexuality, uh, gender, race, and ecology as they arise in the 20th and 21st century television, film, and fiction. She received her doctorate at Cornell University, where she focused on American literature, media studies, and cultural theory. Her current, uh, her current book project is called Forms of Disposability, Agency, Ontology, Ethics, and it observes how our current ethico-political crises are increasingly determined according to a rubric of disposability. In 2019, Dr. Thorstenson joined the English department at St. Thomas University as an assistant professor of media studies. And she's speaking tonight on Orange is the New Black. And without further ado, um, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that, Matthew, uh, for that land acknowledgement and introduction. And uh, thanks so much to uh, Tracy and Christy for organizing and welcoming me here as well. And thanks for everybody for showing up. I'm also um, super excited for Sabine LaBelle's talk coming up next, so I just wanted to give a little shout out for that. It, it also looks wonderful. Uh, so the title of this talk is um, Orange is the New Black Face, Economies of Enjoyment and the Formalist Killjoy. Uh, Orange is the New Black was a seven season American dramedy series that ran between 2013 and 2019. Created for Netflix by Genji Cohen, the first season was based on a memoir of the same name by Piper Kerman. The series explores the past and current lives of several women incarcerated at Litchfield Penitentiary, a, medium or sorry, a minimum security women's federal prison in upstate New York. Although the first season focused on the character arc of Piper, an upper middle class bisexual white woman incarcerated for drug smuggling charges, later seasons took a broader focus and prioritized questions of class, race, language, citizenship status, and sexuality to varying degrees of success and accuracy. We can assume then that, cre that the creators of the show shared two competing goals, uh, entertainment and education. Um, and so I'm just about to switch the slide here, but I just wanted to note that there uh, will be a graphic fictional uh, representation of anti-Black violence here of one of the characters in the show. So I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to prepare and or um, uh, avert their screen. Uh, so 
In the penultimate episode of season four called The Animals, who say Washington here imaged uh, on the floor, a black gay middle-class character loved by audiences and characters alike for her nerdy charm and friend uh, loyalty, dies of asphyxiation at the hands of a distracted and inept prison guard named Baxter Bailey as an in inmate-led protest is pushed to breaking point. Only moments earlier, each female inmate had stood up on a cafeteria table to make collective demands for better treatment, but the private prison guards arrived to break up their peaceful protest. Confronted with this frightening authority, Suzanne, a close friend of Pousset, had an anxiety attack, which guards interpret racially as a violent outburst. Quote, get that animal out of here, end quote, Captain Piscatella demands as they handled her roughly. Pousset hurries to help de-escalate the situation, but her actions are also racially overdetermined. The camera pans back and forth between the surrounding chaos and Pousset's silent pleas, I can't breathe, or perhaps help me. These infamous words were echoed in real life before and after the production of this episode. Eric Garner uttered them in 2014 when he was murdered by Daniel Pantaleo's chokehold, and George Floyd uttered them again in 2020 when he was murdered by Derek Chauvin, who pressed his knee into the back of his neck for several minutes. These real and representational echoes reveal how anti-Black violence is, as Black studies scholar Fred Moten writes, a quote, pouring forth, a holding or spreading out or a running over that never runs out and is never over, a dispersal more than a dispersal, a funding that is not so much a founding as a continual finding of that which is never lost in being lost, end quote. Other Black Studies scholars have described the temporality of this violence in similar terms. Frank B. Wilderson III calls it a, quote, flat line. Hortense Spillers describes it as historical stillness. And Sadia Hartman writes of it as a diffusion uh, over and in time. Indeed, while Suzanne tries to pry Bailey off Pousset's back for several minutes, the outcome of this scene is already overdetermined by this history, which is both real and representational. After she realizes Pousset has died, Suzanne is hauled away in hysterical tears and their friends fall by her lifeless body. Music swells as the camera zooms out in a spiral from above, revealing the circle of horrified and intrigued spectators before fading to black. The unfiltered light, lighting and mute soundtrack that opens the scene produces a startling realism that invokes this larger uh, and real historical context. So this episode, The Animals, taps into these affective and symbolic associations in ways that are either highly appropriative or politically provocative uh, and educational and maybe both. As many have shown, such pervasive images of Black suffering do not tend to end or redress racial violence. They rather function as a hail to whites in the Alphazarian sense, confirming, as uh, Christina Sharp explains, the, quote, status, location, and already held opinions within dominant ideology about those exhibitions of spectacular Black bodies whose meanings then remain unchanged, end quote and the uh, graphic image is now gone. So um, hopefully most people here would be aware of the uh, story of uh, Emmett Till, um, who was lynched in Mississippi in 1955 at the age of 14, after being accused of offending a white woman named Carolyn Bryant. Uh, his murders, Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam were acquitted by an all white jury. And so Emmett Till posthumously became an icon of the civil rights movement, uh, largely because his, his mother um, and others chose to hold an open casket funeral where the brutality of his murder was photographed and then distributed widely. Um, and so the assumption, the, the logic behind this kind of um, strategy of graphic photography was that it would um, guilt and shame and um, you know prompt uh, emotional response from white audiences who would be moved by the image of this, um, you know, horrific uh, murder. 
But of course, we know that the white tears, which such scenes of violence might prompt, can just as easily be weaponized against black people. And so here's an image of uh, the woman that became famously or you know, infamously known as Barbecue Becky, who called police in Oakland in 2018 about a group of black people who were simply just grilling in a public park. Um, and so she was using her tears um, instrumentally through the law um, in order to um, have this, uh, this group of um, people uh, arrested. So we know that the white tears, again, which uh, such scenes of violence might prompt can just as easily be weaponized against black people. Even more troubling, such allusions to anti-Black police brutality and mass incarceration in this series, uh, Orange is the New Black, function as both parody and pastiche in uh, this genre, which has been called dramedy, right? It's both drama and comedy. Um, and so these two different emotional registers um, become sort of problematic for the way that um, they uh, sort of frame these images of anti-Black violence. Both effective registers of imitation trade in what Sadia Hartman calls the economy of enjoyment that has structured and sustained racial violence since slavery. So she writes in Scenes of Subjection, does the scene of the tyrannized slave at the bloodstained gate delight the loathsome master and provide wholesome pleasures to the upright and the virtuous is the act of witnessing a kind of looking no less entangled with the wielding of power and the extraction of enjoyment. So in other words, um, as Sadia, Sadia Hartman would have been asking of, uh, you know, white um, spectators to this kind of anti-Black violence during slavery, we might ask the same questions of ourselves uh, viewing these scenes in Orange uh, is the New Black. Uh, so for Hartman, enjoyment can take the legal sense of the right to enjoy property or the emotional sense that is to take pleasure in something. She identifies two primary modes through which this economy functions. One, the imputation of Black enjoyment and to the spectacle of black suffering. So the former invokes childish or carefree images of Sambo, which we might be familiar with, or blackface minstrels, slave songs, et cetera, uh, which work to dissimulate and disavow racial violence. So the idea is to generate images of you know, happy, um, you know, enslaved, uh, at least at the time that she was writing about, uh, happy uh, enslaved Black people in order to um, sort of uh, justify that context of enslavement. Uh, so, but the latter uh, part of this economy of enjoyment uh, takes two opposing forms. On the one hand, many whites take sadistic pleasure in the spectacle of black suffering, which often entails other material benefits. In the antebellum context, for example, that uh, Sadia Hartman was writing about, sexual assault could involve physical gratification, increase slave property, and ensure greater psychological control over enslaved people. But on the other hand, uh, even those who opposed slavery and racial violence took various kinds of pleasure in assuming the role of the white savior. And we can imagine that might be true of many viewers of Orange's uh, The New Black as well. So for example, by reading what Ian e. Baucom calls melancholy realism, white abolitionists like Harriet Beecher Stowe, the writer of Uncle Tom's Cabin, could extend their subjective powers into the bodies of others, experiment sadomasochistically with black suffering from the safety of their armchairs, reinscribe black people as objects and simultaneously redeem themselves of moral guilt by you know, claiming this role of the white savior. And we can see in the image here, um, you know, on, on this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, you know, a kind of um, summary image of, of the white savior. Um, so all of these so-called pleasures that Hartman describes that uh, would have secured the institution of slavery can also be traced in contemporary race conscious media, such as Orange is the New Black. Um, and so here's an image of Suzanne, um, who after uh, Pusey's death, um, Pusey was the librarian in the, in the prison. And so um, 
uh, Suzanne takes the books that were under Pousset's bed and she uh, covers them on her chest. And um, their friend Tasty says, I know you're trying to feel closer to her, but, and then Suzanne interrupts, no, I'm not. I want to know what it feels like to not breathe. Pousset keeps extra books under her bed, special books. It's like the library VIP room under there. Kept, keeps kept. So in that moment, she kind of forgets that the, the reality of her friend's death. Um, but also we see, you know, in the way that abolitionists, the abolitionist movement was so much um, part of these kinds of novels like uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and abolitionist literature, we get this kind of metaphorical image here of how uh, Suzanne is um, sort of trying to experiment with the feelings of asphyxiation under the weight of these books, right? Under the weight of these kind of melancholic realist uh, books, we might say. So as Hartman's analysis highlights, we are in a troublesome double bind here. Laughing and crying can both trade in this economy of enjoyment. This puts us in a tenuous position as the spectators of Pousset's asphyxiation, particularly that, uh, you know, as Millie Vanderwerf and Ashley Ray Harris have said in Vox, um, while Orange's audiences uh, racially diverse, what data we have suggests that it's watched by a lot of white people, and that would be including myself as the writer of this uh, paper as well. So while this final scene of the animals trades in sentimental or melancholy realism, zooming in on distraught faces, circling grandly outwards and upwards, swelling music, fading to black, all of these things that would suggest a certain kind of sonorous or serious engagement with the material. Um, the gags grind on in the following episode, Toast Can't Never Be Bred Again. Given our Netflix culture of binge watching, it's likely that many, if not most viewers, feel themselves swinging dizzily between these two emotional extremes in this economy of white enjoyment. So I'm offering this talk in part to figure out some of my own uncertainties about my position as a spectator to this semi-fictional, but also kind of very real violence. Um, and I'm interested in the feeling of awkwardness and discomfort I have when watching this scene and those that follow. There is something I think that feels off about the timing and juxtaposition of jokes that makes me think the feeling of awkwardness is not just my own, but something in the membrane between the show and myself that breaks down. The mixed and passionate reviews that follow the season, uh, season four, bear out similar feelings of unease. The way Pousset, quote, died and the order of events that took place leading up to her death make me question what the writers were expecting, explains Ashley Shackelford. I'm at a crossroads of wanting to critique the show because it allows for us to have conversations about the realities of prison, systemic racism, misogyny, sexual assault, white fragility, white privilege, and anti-Blackness. But I also just want to throw up. It's like the entire show is written as a season-long trauma porn, end quote. So like these confused audience members, I'm trying to give a language to my discomfort. Like Shackelford, I believe the trauma porn elements of the show are intentional, but I also wonder if the failure of comic relief and the denials of sympathetic sentiment in these episodes are also perhaps intentional, or if they're not intentional um, by the show's creators, I wonder if the failure of these forms of pleasure, in other words, the failure of the comic relief in these um, final episodes, um, that I find, right, that, that, that failed pleasure in me um, and these other viewers that I cite might offer a blueprint for intervening into the economy of enjoyment that Hartman described. So I'm a little bit at a crossroads here um, between kind of deciding if, if this is a formalist issue, something in the form of the episodes themselves, or if it's um, kind of a reader response thing where it's sort of my reaction to um, what I'm seeing in the form or if it's some uh, kind of strange combination of both that, that kind of breaks down those um, literary criticism boundaries. But anyway, perhaps um, you can help me think through that. Uh, so to do all this, I turn to Sarah Ahmed's figure of the feminist killjoy to sketch an interpretive attitude what I call the formalist killjoy. So I call the formalist killjoy an attitude rather than an approach or a role because it does not involve solving problems, unfortunately, um, in, a, in a sense, really. Uh, we'll see anyway. 
but rather the formalist killjoy sets herself out as the problem, right? So I'm, I realize that I'm the problem in my engagement with this problematic form. Um, and I realize that it's a problematic form in part because it fails to achieve um, its own generic expectations, right, of, of comedy. So uh, to clarify, Sarah Ahmed's figure of the, of the feminist killjoy, she writes, feminists in the room bring others down, not only by talking about unhappy topics such as sexism, but by exposing how happiness is sustained by erasing the signs of not getting along. For example, when sexist jokes are not laughed at, joy is killed in the very failure to extend these bodily and social forms of normativity, right? So the kind of the form of the joke is interrupted because it relies on a particular response from the, from the listener. So elsewhere, Ahmed describes Martin Heidegger's hammer, ready to hand when it pounds a nail or present to hand when it breaks. Um, and she reminds us that Heidegger says, it, uh, the hammer is given a definite character in its being present at hand in such, a, in such a manner, only now are we given any access to properties or the like, right? So when we're using a hammer, um, and it's an extension of our body and our will, and it's moving with intention, we're not thinking about the properties of the hammer, but when the hammer breaks and that circuit is interrupted, then we're suddenly very interested and aware of the formal um, properties of the hammer, right? Um, and the fact that, that the, those formal properties are broken. So likewise, the formalist kill, or rather uh, alternatively, the formalist killjoy evidences the always already ethical brokenness of functioning forms through a general present to hand attitude. So when her hammer seems to break, uh, when the uh, uh, comedy seems to fail, the formalist killjoy finds she has actually been holding a functioning club or has actually been upholding a system of white supremacy, right? The, the um, economy of white enjoyment that Hartman describes. So what initially seemed to be formal failures, the club fails to be a hammer, the dramedy fails to be either humorous or sentimental, draw us into a present to hand attention whereby the form's functions are exposed as ethical failures. What we have thought a hammer is in fact a club. What we have thought enjoyable is in fact a means of oppression. So the formalist killjoy does not wait for these forms to break, but rather breaks them through a general present to hand attitude and thus breaks us of our attachments to them, right? So by watching uh, Orange is the New Black with this particular kind of attitude um, and, and um, being disappointed at um, the failed comedy uh, might break that form of pleasure that, that kind of attaches us to it. So this attitude emerges at the point where form and interpretation meet. Formalist literary criticism has recently taken this turn. Carolyn Levine avoids, quote, asking what artists intend or even what forms do, but rather explores what potentialities lie latent, though not always obvious in aesthetic and social arrangements. We might thus draw on both for a formalist killjoy attitude, not to break forms, but allow them to break through us. Failing to find comedic relief or sentimental identifications in these final episodes of Orange is the New Black, our focus shifts to the inherent problems of genre. The very present to hand attention given to this failure reroutes our frustrations against the functioning form itself angry no longer with the broken hammer, but with the intact club, right? So although we might first feel kind of frustrated that the joke isn't funny, um, those frustrations get rerouted by um, certain elements of the show into an alignment with the frustrations of the characters against um, the racist carceral machine. Our surplus emotional energy continually repressed by our failed generic expectation swings into alignment with the inmates who revolt against Litchfield Prison by the end of Toast Can't Never Be Read Again. As one reviewer describes, it is a, quote, testament to the careful construction of this season that viewers are, on some level, hooting along with the mob of inmates for Dea to spill some prison guard blood. Individually, Humphrey, a corporate representative, is a monster. Collectively, we've come to see MCC as something worse, a carefully calibrated machine that treats inmates as objects, end quote. 
By the end of this episode, surely we can add orange is the new black to this list of callous and opportunistic parties. Um, so there's something of a kind of paradox maybe in what I'm working through here. Um, but yet, if we take a formalist killjoy attitude, we can see that the episode also bears itself and us out as problems. And so I'll just move now into a close reading of some scenes and images here um, to kind of bear out what I'm talking about. So uh, consider when prison director Joe Caputo visits his girlfriend, Linda, from purchasing, but is interrupted by the wife of an inmate who complains about poor treatment for her partner. In a scene that surely evokes the killings of Sandra Bland and Darnisha Harris, Linda pulls out her gun on Crystal Bursette. Although no black woman is shot or killed, anticipating such an event seems to thrill Caputo and Linda in their following sexual encounter. The explicit juxtaposition of anti-Black violence with white sexual gratification uh, is a pointed reminder about the economies of enjoyment, this very show, that structure and sustain mass incarceration, um, as well as uh, what Hartman described of uh, the context of slavery. Indeed, our laughable disgust with their excessive fondling, it's, it's presented in a very unattractive manner, um, is uh, um, uh, blends with our pronounced discomfort over the excessive levity of the scene itself. Later, Linda, the same character, sits on the toilet browsing her cell phone while the women begin to revolt around her in the prison. Literally caught with her pants down, the witty visual metaphor makes her impending embarrassment palpable and thus overshadows the real danger of her situation. The clownish music in this scene alerts us to the comedy of the image, but our nervous chuckles are rather complex. Are we simply chuffed that we are clever enough to get the joke, the visual metaphor here, or are we gratified that Linda has finally found herself in a precarious and, embar and embarrassing position? Or are we a bit anxious about our own complicity as spectators who have been metaphorically caught with our own pants down in the exchange of what Andrew Diltz uh, calls, after Hartman, carceral enjoyments? Uh, so too, when Flacca, here pictured, is encouraged to sharpen her eye pencil for the impending revolt, she responds stupidly, I use liquid liner. Such a retort reveals the incredibly chaotic, unplanned, and thus somewhat silly nature of the situation. But in the wake of Pousset's death, these lighthearted quips fall flat. Indeed, such tonal dissonance makes sentimental identification with most characters very difficult. And it is thus the ensemble of inmates we join effectively as they rise together against the prison. So it's very difficult throughout these episodes to find any sort of um, sympathy or, or kind of uh, identification with these characters because they all appear to be um, quite cold hearted um, uh, and kind of tonally uh, out of sync. Uh, similarly, fellow inmates Angie and Leanne drunkenly echo the vaudevillian bits of Abbott and Costello. One, one writes or one says, uh, what's Attica? The other responds, maybe the dad from that bird book to kill a mockingjay? The other responds, hungry games, and they run off together to join uh, the, the riot. This rather nuanced intertextual joke seems at odds with its slapstick performance. The fourth wall breaks when the resultant interference pattern between high and low comedic genres calls our attention to the functioning of form itself. On the one hand, uh, this satire functions through the failure of farce, right? Well, it's kind of meta, uh, comedic. We're laughing at the failure of their stupid jokes, right? Seeing these characters as constructions, we do not laugh at them so much as with them in spite of themselves, because we understand on some level that these are actors kind of playing a part in a, a comedy. On the other hand, the failure of this farce calls our attention back to the ethical problems inherent to such satirical abstractions, right? We kind of catch ourselves in the moment um, thinking, you know, how, how is it that in the wake of this kind of, um, you know, graphic scene and, and uh, scene of loss that we can be asked to laugh um, in this kind of way and abstract ourselves from that situation. And so, um, you know, given this kind of blending of high and low comedic genres too, I do want to think a little bit more carefully 
um, about the class distinctions of this slapstick intertextuality. Somehow the failure of the slapstick farce only seems possible through the success of the intertextual uh, self-reflexive wit. Um, so there might also be something to say about the way that these problems um, of kind of race and carceriality and so forth get borne out um, through this comedy that has problematic implications for, um, you know, kind of reinscribing uh, class distinctions and um, especially class distinctions of, of aesthetics. Earlier, another comedic duo clownishly put on face masks and practiced their frowns for the expected news cameras, right? These two characters are um, sort of renowned and, and comedic for um, their uh, almost crazy desire to uh, find fame um, even behind bars. Switching easily between melancholic performance and heartfelt hysterics, Flacca and Maritza remind us of the ethical problems inherent to acting, spectating, and empathy itself. Moreover, their whitened faces resemble blackface in reverse, simultaneously incriminating whites for this economy of enjoyment that is calling to mind this history of blackface, which uh, trade, you know, is in this kind of comedic genre, um, and so asks us to kind of critique that, that, um, that uh, history of, of the genre. Um, but also infantilizing whiteness itself as the object of humor instead, right? Taking the place of, of the black face. But the image is not reducible to a simple reverse racial configuration of blackface um, because it in fact gestures to the trope of reverse racism as part of the joke, right? So the idea that you could even have um, a kind of reverse race image that blackface could be turned on its head into whiteface, um, the kind of ridiculousness of that given the um, overwhelming kind of uh, socio-political and economic structure of racism that this is all taking part in um, is part of the joke, right? The, the absurdity of the idea that reverse racism could be um, could happen. And yet this is a complicated image that is both critical of and complicit in racist and sexist economies of enjoyment. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that whiteness is in part denigrated here by being gendered feminine with the um, associations that the, the whitened faces have here with face masks and uh, the way that these women are trying to prepare themselves, uh, be beautify themselves for the cameras. Indeed, this final episode often plainly evokes the long history of racist humor, and yet characters chastise each other for making such uh, jokes in several instances. So we see performed for us in several instances, characters actually kind of uh, being sort of formalist killjoys themselves and interrupting the jokes made by other characters, perhaps as a kind of model or example for us as viewers, uh, I don't know. We thus have to disentangle several formal layers the jokes told and interpreted by characters, but also the jokes set up through these characters and through us. We laugh with and at characters as well as with and at ourselves, hopefully. For example, when Pousset's body is finally collected by authorities after being abandoned on the cafeteria floor all night, uh, of course, this is reminiscent of the actual case of Mike Brown, uh, the gang of white supremacists laugh, shit, why bother with an ambulance, huh? I mean, it's not like she's going to get well. Pousset's friend Janae steps up, what the fuck did she say, and punches her. But then, as if needing the communion that laughter brings, the group of Black women begin teasing Allison about the bright red hair peeking through her hijab. And so this is another example of the kind of tonal dissonance that I'm talking about, where we have this very serious and emotionally charged moment, and then immediately it switches out into this kind of comedic, um, comedic moment here with friends. But this is clearly an inside joke neither funny to other characters nor likely to white viewers who we know from the data are um, the primary uh, viewership for Orange is the New Black. Indeed, the laughter does not mark the success of the joke so much as a welcome failure of appropriate mourning here for these women. An accidental exposure, both metaphorical and literal, that distracts from real loss. The scene surely reveals for us what Christina Sharp calls wake work, quote, the fact of black life as proximate to death, black life insisted from death, end quote. <clears throat> this turn to comedic relief thus nuances what we have been calling the economy of enjoyment. The affordances of a joke will depend on intentions, interpretations, and contexts. 
um, as well as uh, the, the people who are telling and receiving the jokes. So some of my arguments or ideas here might also be kind of um, predicated on the fact of my own embodiment as a viewer, as a um, sort of a middle class uh, relatively young, you know, um, white gay woman. Um, and so maybe the kind of formalist killjoy attitude that I'm describing here is not necessarily um, scalable or universal, um, but is maybe still somewhat useful to think about anyhow. Uh, so yet, yeah, while we understand that our interpretive position shapes the meaning of these jokes, there is no time to orient ourselves toward them, right? There's something about the speed, the timing of the jokes in, in these episodes here that is very disorienting. Uh, we hardly have time to laugh amidst the quick succession of scenes striking different emotional chords. Moreover, the episode often frustrates generic conventions, cutting short or awkwardly extending the beats of comedic timing, and thus forces us to feel uncomfortable. Unable to understand the basis and target of our laughter, we cannot locate ourselves in relation to this humor, and so any idea of aesthetic distance falls apart. So we realize in this failure of, of comic relief, right, that we're actually a part of the circuit here. We're part of the form, that our laughter sustains uh, this uh, kind of these economies of pleasure and enjoyment. And um, in, that, in that failure um, to laugh, we, we lose that aesthetic distance, that ability to set ourselves aside from um, the images that we're witnessing, at least I contend. Whether tickled, angry, or sad, we have a lingering sense that something is wrong, but whether it's ethical or formal, we're not sure. Many have identified uh, mass incarceration as the primary vehicle of racialized social control in the U United States uh, since slavery and segregation. Indeed, Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore see it as a neoliberal fix to state and economic surplus. Martha D. Escobar shows how civil rights disrupted the legal exploitation of black labor since slavery and prisons now warehouse the resultant racial neoliberal excess. And Michelle Alexander's compendium of statistics and citations um, confirms uh, that this uh, crisis is no laughing matter. Yet somehow Orange is the New Black frames these issues through irreverent and over the top humor. Given Sigmund Freud's theory that laughter releases surplus emotional energy, uh, usually used for repression, this combination of form and content might be rather fitting. Uh, but then we should ask of Freud what happens when the joke fails to all of this surplus emotional energy? Might the formalist killjoy attitude reroute this emotional energy away from our pleasure pleasurable uh, melancholic attachments to these scenes and, and this uh, car carceral machinery uh, and toward a form of what C Christina Sharp calls wake work. And uh, before I uh, sort of conclude here, I just wanna give a couple of other examples of um, formalist killjoys um, or who I believe are formalist killjoys, but not uh, not white formalist killjoys, just to um, try and show that this um, is maybe um, a, an approach or, or an attitude, as I've said, that can, um, that can be more broadly applicable. Uh, this here um, is an image of Parker Bright, who's uh, interrupting a kind of uh, kaleidoscope of forms of um, kind of uh, transference of, of images of anti-Black violence. So just to go through the stages of, of what we're looking at here, we're looking at Scott Young's Twitter picture, which captures uh, these two anonymous observers who we can see traces on their phone also capturing um, images of Parker Bright's Black Death Spectacle, which is a perform piece of performance art that he conducted um, to disrupt this uh, um, uh, painting by Dana Schutz, uh, which was inspired by the famous or perhaps infamous um, photo by David Jackson of uh, Emmett Till's murder, right? And so um, there, David Jackson's uh, photograph uh, received um, kind of mixed reviews. Um, obviously, some feel that the, the image was um, imperative for the civil rights movement, but others feel that um, these sorts of images of anti-Black violence also um, come at great cost as well in terms of normalizing or extending um, uh, the violence. Um, and then Dana Schutz, of course, also received a lot of criticism for her impressionist painting for the way that she appeared to almost beautify um, this scene. Um, and as a white woman, that became even more kind of ethically contentious. 
Uh, and so here we have another image of, and hopefully you can see all this, but um, I'm not sure who took the, this photograph, but I do know that it is of Angela Peoples here on the lower left, um, who is interrupting this scene of um, a number of uh, white female protesters at uh, the March on Washington in the wake of um, President Donald Trump's um, uh, inauguration. And uh, here, Peoples is holding a sign that says, don't forget, white women voted for Trump. And so we have this kind of white savior complex image here um, that we can remember from when I was talking about um, the abolitionist discourse. Um, and she's intervening with her body, as well as this reminder here into that kind of circuit of enjoyment. So she's sort of rerouting um, uh, or, or disrupting that kind of um, uh, that form. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just kind of conclude here by um, pointing out that uh, this is where the formalist or the formalist killjoy kind of concept or attitude that I'm suggesting, um, who works to make herself the problem, runs into another ethical and conceptual problem. That is, um, I, I kind of, you know, get a little bit confused here about um, trying to explain what the real goal of this project is. My goal is not to redeem Orange is the New Black from critique, um, but I guess it's uh, to read as far as possible without redemption. Orange is the New Black isn't good, um, and, you know, probably neither am I, um, but it does seem like something destructive and generative emerges at the point of our meeting. It is precisely this problem of redemption, after all, that structures both the ideal of prison reform and the ideas that prisons reform. Uh, as Lyndon Barrett says, relatives of value are ratios of violence. Since the prison is itself an instrument of moral and political differentiation, and given that racial terror mixes in equal parts with humor and sentiment, disrupting our carceral enjoyments, and our melancholic attachments to them is very difficult indeed. How do we recuperate convicted individuals or our own critical methodologies and ethical frameworks, our positions as spectators, uh, without relying on the worthy, unworthy moral axis through which prisons operate in the first place? What genres and affects do not trade in these economies of enjoyment? Uh, instead of looking for good forms or even good reading strategies, I suggest the formalist killjoy, an attitude that fails to embody or practice what it should, can unmake or make us as problems. And so thank you so much. Thank you.